Welcome to the LDN Radio Show, brought to you by the LDN Research Trust. I'm your host, Linda Elsigood. I have an exciting lineup of guest speakers who are LDN experts in their field. We will be discussing low dose naltrexone and its many uses in autoimmune diseases, cancers, etc. Thank you for joining us. This show is sponsored by Dixon's Chemist, who are the experts in LDN and associated treatments in the UK. Dixon's Chemists are the most cost-effective for LDN in all forms within the UK and Europe, maintaining safety standards far in excess of what is required. Why would you choose to get your LDN from anywhere else? Call 0141 404 6545 today to speak to their LDN experts. Today my guest is Dr Timothy Swager, who's a naturopathic physician and he can help individuals with non-pharmaceutical approaches to blood pressure, depression, anxiety and insomnia. He works with all age groups and has a wide scope of practice. Thank you for joining us today, Tim. Thank you. Now, we know that you treat all these conditions. How does LDM play a part in your program of treating your patients? Well, I, I look at low-dose naltrexone as one of my options when patients come into my practice. I, I first started using low-dose naltrexone back in California, Bastyr University. After actually being introduced to low-dose naltrexone by my daughter, she was the one that told me about it. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll think about it. Hmm. So I had a, my first patient that came into my practice the best year was, had rheumatoid arthritis, and it was right after I learned about its anti-inflammatory properties. So I, I tried it on a patient there, and I was pretty impressed with the results. Within less than two months, she was able to make a fifth, which she wasn't able to do before, and it reduced her inflammatory markers, her CRP or C-reactive protein, dramatically. So that's, that's when I got excited about it. And um, a- after that, I started using it for various conditions, autoimmune conditions because of its history. Uh, I, I've tried it on a few patients with post-traumatic stress syndrome in um, California with military people. And, and then I moved here to Prescott, Arizona. And, and um, I, I always think about using low-dose naltrexone for, for any array of issues. And, and so it's the decision, try to come up with a decision on when and, and how to use it is the uh, challenge for me. Mm-hmm. And we said there that you work with all age groups, but obviously... Um the uh, blood pressure, depression, anxiety, and insomnia, I would have thought is usually for the older population rather than children. Do you treat children as well? I, I treat children. I primarily, when I look at my population and children, most of my practice has been centered around issues with anxiety and autism. Uh-huh. And what approach do you use? Um, do you incorporate LDN in autism treatment from the word go, or do you use that further down the line? I've actually not used it in autism at this point. I had um, triplets, actually, in uh, at California. But my approach there was more of an approach with nutrition and diet. I, I, at that point, I was just new and using LDN, and I, I, I actually didn't consider using it on, on that patient, but um, those three patients that I probably would consider it now. But my approach at that point was with diet, and, and I did do some extensive testing, nutritional interest, uh, testing to see what they were deficient in or high in. So that was my approach. Um, since moving to Prescott, I, I've worked with a few children, not a lot, um, 
but mostly with anxiety that that's probably in the insomnia. Mm -hmm. Wow. I didn't realize uh, children had insomnia. That for a yeah, parent would be very you know, uh, a lot of times it's yeah. hard. Sorry. Wouldn't it? If you've got a child with uh, insomnia, it must be very difficult. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's difficult because they're frustrated at that point and none of them really want to go on medications for their anxiety or um, problem sleeping. So I work with, um, try to work with sleep hygiene and issues that are going on with fear that the child has or the anxiety close to bedtime, those kind of things. And I can usually uh, pinpoint some issues that are, can be helped with uh, mm. using natural methods. When you talk about sleep hygiene and, and I immediately think, well, children, what are they doing near bedtime? Well, they're probably playing on the computer or Xboxes or some form of game, um, internet gaming, which must be difficult for parents um, to monitor the children to stop them from using such devices before going to bed. Yeah, in fact, you know, I, I, that issue is across the board with age groups. I mean, I, I have adults that have the same issue. They take their computers to bed and they play games or they are on the computer and they can't shut off their mind. Mm. So I, a part of a sleep hygiene for children and adults is to spend the last hour doing something non-electronic. Mm -hmm. And I, I suppose even going back 20 years, I wouldn't have thought that was such a big problem as it is today. No, we had television back then, and that, that sometimes patients, uh, people use TV as a way to relax, mm -hmm. and they did it in their bedroom. So um, before I got in, being a physician, I was actually, my specialty was sleep disorders. I was uh, a sleep technologist for many years before I became a physician, so I, I'm a little more sensitive to the potential problems that come with sleep disorders. And so my first job is to to identify a potential sleep disorder that can be fixed um, and then look at other issues. And usually the issues are some kind of sleep hygiene issue, uh, irregular sleep wake patterns, or anxiety is a huge factor in being hyped up at night and people just can't shut off. Uh, that's probably one of the uh, major issues that all age groups have. Mm -hmm. Now I have multiple sclerosis and Normally, I get up like twice in the night, but sometimes when I have a, a UTI, I wake up more often. And sometimes then that is difficult, getting back to sleep uh, when you've had your sleep disturbed, you know, quite often through the night. What do you do for patients who wake up to go to the toilet in the night excessively? Um, well, I look at urinary problems. It, are they... Uh... If it's a female, some kind of history of urinary tract infections or problems with bladder control. And with men, it's, you know, large prostate and have to get up a lot at night. Mm -hmm. So I, I look at those first to, to see if it's an issue um, that can be corrected by different means. Mm. But, I mean, there's nothing really you can do to make people uh, fall back to sleep quicker is there once you've, I don't know, I haven't well, cracked some, that you one know, I do, I, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, with multiple sclerosis or some kind of some neurological conditions, sometimes I, I use magnesium um, in an intramuscular injection form. And that seems to, in some cases, relax the system. Mm -hmm. I've tried um, oral um, magnesium and that just never seemed to work well but I, I do a, I've been using IM injections with magnesium on patients with Parkinson's and MS and other conditions neurological conditions and sometimes that seems to work much better than uh, other things melatonin I use a lot of mm -hmm. melatonin if they uh, trial and error but I use uh, the melatonin with magnesium sometimes uh, 
and sometimes that does help. And then I teach them how to do the injections themselves. Really? Wow. Now, you see, I would, <laughs> I would suffer from anxiety if I knew that I'd got to have um, yeah. <laughs> an injection in my muscle. I, uh, that would really, I really don't like needles. Yeah, that um, I do run into that situation. So sometimes I'll just have them come in and I'll do it once a week. Um, and some, and it sometimes the it lasts for quite a you know like a whole week or longer. Mm-hmm. Can't, I can't figure out why it works. I started using on a patient with MS many years ago, and I the magnesium oral wasn't working, so I just thought why well, I'd try uh, intramuscular magnesium, and um, I still continue to use that. Hmm. I don't. <laughs> I don't know if I'd put my hand up for that one. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm well. Not it's not for everybody. <laughs> I, I sometimes I'll use sometimes I use um, glutathione for patients that have neurological conditions. To sometimes some of their um, they seem to help. It helps them relax a little better. And uh, but I use nasal. Uh, I've used multiple different types of glutathione in my mm-hmm. career. The nasal glutathione that's been coming out compounded um seems it's a little pricey but it seems to sometimes work like magnesium Mm -hmm. and how have you found patients with multiple sclerosis that use ldn to be honest um since i've been in prescott for the last couple years i've I've not i've seen patients with parkinson's and other conditions but i don't think i've seen Patients with multiple sclerosis here, so I I can't really okay. comment on that. What about thyroid issues? Well, that that's an interesting. Um, I when I went to the low dose naltrexone conference in Portland, what was that last year? The year before? Last year. Uh, time flies. Mm-hmm. Um, I had a, one of my patients in California approach me because she was having problems regulating her thyroid medication and just not feeling well and she was basically kind of told well there's nothing we can do because you're on levothyroxine and that's all you can do and we can't help any other way so I was treating her mother actually I, um, who was on low dose naltrexone it's still a patient of mine after four years now and um, she I told her about low dose naltrexone potential benefits for autoimmune conditions because she was having a hard time regulating her thyroid levels and she was feeling fatigue and just joint pains all over and it was kind of like a mixture of thyroid and fibromyalgia type symptoms but so I started her on two milligrams of low dose naltrexone just two months ago actually uh, when I was visiting back there I saw them her and her mother and she actually just talked to her last week, and she, she had a 50% improvement in her how she felt. Uh, we tested her thyroid levels. I switched her to Nature Thyroid from levothyroxine, and she's doing quite well. And I, she wanted to up her dose of low-dose naltrexone, so I increased it um, just last week. So we'll see how she does, but she's very happy. Her levels seem to be, and her blood work looked great, so it seemed to be good for her. I didn't make any other changes except the nature thyroid and the low dose naltrexone. So. Mm-hmm. Well, that's, that's really good. And of course, you will have known from the, the conference, I mean, it's used for hypothyroidism, hyperthyroidism, Hashimoto's, Graves' disease. And these people are finding that LDN works. Um, I wouldn't say 100% of the time, but it does seem to work for the majority of people. And they do manage to reduce their thyroid medication. And generally, if they've got several, you know, a cocktail of medications, they can actually eliminate some of the medications. And having a, a natural approach as well, especially diet, seems to be a very big um, factor for that patient population, especially um, yeah. gluten-free. I mean, do you find that in your practice, that 
uh, eliminating gluten helps? Well, I, 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 that was my initial approach, but more in the last five years or so, I have kind of used more grain-free approach, with, which is kind of like, you know, with the, with the gluten-free approach, my patients were still a little frustrated because they couldn't figure, they you know, were always worried about, does this have gluten in it? Does, that, does this grain have it? Is it cross-contaminated? So I, I went to a grain-free diet for autoimmune conditions and inflammatory conditions. And I found my patients were having, an, I, I can't say easier time, but it was a, easier to make choices. And, and then for those patients that responded well to that, but not completely and still had gas and bloating frequently, I, I started using the FODMAP diet. And I've been using the FODMAP approach without grains um, in probably the last couple of years with good success. Mm-hmm. And how long do you keep your patients on the FODMAP diet? Um, I, I do. I start with a month. If you know the challenge is trying to get them through the first month, and and then once they get through the first month, they actually, uh, if they get improvements, they actually decide they're going to stay on it for a while. Mm-hmm. So um, if once they feel better, I have a, I had a patient that was suffering from gas and bloating for three years, tried gluten free and everything, and just didn't do well and I put him on the FODMAP diet and he continues to this day to do quite well so he's continued it religiously and, wow. and is very happy with it. I think I did the FODMAP diet for about four months. Um, I was tested positive for SIBO so yeah. it was changing everything um, but I think I was on the FODMAP diet for about four months but it's very restricting isn't it what you can eat yeah uh, it, yeah and if they have families that don't do it it's it that's uh, sometimes with any dietary change if especially if they're the main person preparing food if it's if it's not embraced by the family it's difficult too so mm. it's not an easy diet to do but um, no. it works well on patients and, and it's just a piece and sometimes they can't maintain it it's mm. correct, yeah. well after the SIBO settled down um, and wasn't an issue I was then tested for food sensitivities so keep bearing in mind how restrictive the FODMAC diet is I then found out there were I couldn't eat eggs at all the whites or the yolks couldn't have yeast I couldn't have that not having yeast meant I couldn't have fermented things like dried fruit um, Vinegar, um, I couldn't have sesame seeds for some reason. I couldn't have peanuts or wal- uh, Brazil nuts. Uh, there was a certain white fish I couldn't have. Don't ask me why. And the list went on and on and on. And I thought, wow. You probably said, I want to well, go back on the fun. <laughs> yeah, that would have been easier. But it was funny because the I'd kept off eggs for about a year but then I slowly had occasionally say um, gone somewhere where they've had a special gluten-free vegan slice of cake or something and I'd think well there's only going to be a small amount of egg in that and I'll risk it and I'd been fine and we went to the conference in Glasgow um, a month ago I guess uh, nearly a month ago and uh, breakfast was very tricky they didn't embrace the gluten free and it meant I could have some bacon and I could have some I couldn't have mushrooms but I could have some baked beans and I could have tomatoes and they said would you like a fried egg and I thought mm, uh. so I said yes please and I was given two so I said to my husband, what do you think? And he said, well, you won't know if you don't try them. And I said, oh, and I ate them and they were the best eggs I'd ever eaten. <laughs> and it was about 15, 20 minutes later, my stomach went, and I thought, oh, I've got to run to a toilet. I've got to run to a toilet. So I won't be eating eggs anymore. I've I've tried it. I've done it. And not to be repeated, uh, that was... Horrible, 
So, yeah. but of course, the yeast thing I do sometimes when I go somewhere have some gluten free bread, which obviously has got yeast in it. But I've never had a reaction like the egg thing. I guess two eggs when you're not used to eggs and you know you're sensitive to them was a bit of a stupid thing to do. But uh, yeah. so you have to try it, like your husband said. You do, don't you? Try it, and then you you learn the hard way, and it sticks with you then, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Mm. So when you have a patient come to see you, what is the first thing you do? I guess you take down a very detailed history. What do you do as in trying to correct everything that uh, isn't working quite well with them? Yeah, I mean, you know, part of it's collecting a lot of information. But I, you know, I have, I, I, I really like to get to know the person in a kind of an emotional, psychological way because I, that's just my background. I, I really like to know what's going on with them. I, I especially like to know what they've tried and, important to know both with medications and non-medications what they've tried and and what they're on I mean a lot of patients are on I get some patients that are on a hundred it seems like a hundred supplements but you know it's kind of like the same problem as when I get patients that are on five or six medications that it's you know it's it's a challenge so that's one thing I need. I try to sort out. I look at the medications and if they're wanting to get off medications, I want to, I try to get to know them a little better because one of my approaches is to sometimes not so much with the medications unless I can, but to start fresh, you know, look, just take them off everything. And if I, and then start fresh, um, it depends on the issue, of course, and mm-hmm. some of the things that they're taking uh, are necessary, and I leave those for later. But um, I, I think for me, it's important to establish a really good rapport and try to understand what they really want. You know, what 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 have they tried, and what do they need, and what are they really uh, looking for? Because if I don't ask that question, I I feel like I'm really at a loss with how to help them. Mm-hmm. And gaining patients' trust must be a big deal as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I, because I'm a little older and been in practice for, what, 19 years, um, I mean, I, I think that's probably the number one thing. I, I try to, I try to kind of try to be real and, and try to be sensitive to their needs. And there's sometimes I, I just never can have that trust develop, but most of the time I just find it pretty easy for me to do it. I, I kind of put my shoes in their side and think, what would I, what would I want, and what would I need? And it's pretty easy for me. Mm-hmm. What would you say are the most common supplements that you recommend your patients to take? Like a natural substance? Yes. Um. I I try I I like homeopathy a lot. I and it's funny because when I here in Arizona I have a very full scope of practice. I'm, and when I moved to California, I was a little restricted because they have such regulations on some of the scope of practice I could do here in Arizona. So I started using herbs a lot more, and I started using homeopathy a lot more. And and homeopathy is a very safe form of treatment and it deals with both the physical and emotional and psychological components so i i always i guess in my brain starts to think about okay what remedy are are they representing and so that's kind of on the in terms of supplements or giving something natural that's probably one of the more common things i'm consistent with i i use that and uh, nutritionally i i tend to try to look at what their basic needs are um, in, with their diets or they have a bad diet. And probably the most common supplement I use overall is the B-complex, a good B-complex. So I guess that's probably the most common supplement I recommend. Mm-hmm. And what's your thoughts on probiotics? You know, I, I, 
I try to probiotics. I do use in cases where they really have a disruption in the microflora, and sometimes I do testing and stool analysis. But probiotics in general, I think, I, I think people tend to think more probiotics the better. But I, I I try to stay very simple, and I look at dietary changes first. Um, a lot of the patients are on probiotics already. Um, it's interesting because. The FODMAP diet is interesting because fructooligosaccharides are a part of a lot of probiotics, and I sometimes find that those can aggravate people, so I usually recommend probiotics without FOS, the fructooligosaccharides in them. And I found that particularly uh, important on those autistic kids in California. One of the kids was getting a rash and developed and had all sorts of problems, and his two other siblings were doing okay, and I found they were taking probiotics with FOS in it, and I took him off that, and within two weeks, he was doing great. So I, I look at the probiotics, and I look at quality. It's an, if I'm going to use them, I, I like to use very pure products. Mm -hmm. Okay. You were saying that some people take um, a vast amount of supplements, vitamins, et cetera. Do people have to be careful of not taking too many or um, do any of them interact with others in a negative way? What is uh, yeah, the yeah. guidelines for that? That's a, I mean, that's something I, I try, try to look at all their supplements and if they're on medications, I, if I don't know and can't tell them right then, I research and look at what might be a problem. I remember a patient of mine that was on Coumadin, um, warfarin, for blood thinning, and um, he was taking a Chinese herb. And I found that one of the particular substances his uh, lab results looked really bad. So. Once I realized he was, that was an interaction, I took him off the Chinese herb. So I, it's a it's a difficult thing because the patients, the supplements they get are all over the place. They get them anywhere in the internet. Mm. They, I try to figure out if it's a good quality. I, I have them bring them in and look at some of the hidden ingredients in them, and I point out to them that look at all the sugars in this, or look mm. at this, what's in here. They you know, so it's, it's it's a challenge. That's a big challenge. I can remember talking to a nutritionist several years ago now, and she had done a study on uh, omega-3s, on fish oils, and she was saying that some of them uh, were very low in EPA, but very high in vitamin A. So the amount of EPA that was recommended for a day, you would have had to have taken three of these capsules, but then you would have been overdosing on vitamin A which then becomes toxic, she was saying. So I thought that was a bit of a minefield. But as you were saying, you can buy vitamins and supplements from anywhere. And if you're not a doctor or research scientist or something, you probably are not aware of what makes a good one and what is a poor quality. It would There is no regulation as a standard, is there, for um, these supplements yeah. and vitamins? Okay. You know, there are, I mean, there are third-party quality control companies. So um, one of the things that I like to do is use companies that have been their quality checked mm -hmm. through third parties. And yeah. so there are good good checks and balances if you right. use the right company. Oh, that's uh, good to know because you really need uh, – <laughs> you, you don't want to spend your money on something – that isn't what you believe it to be. You know, it would be best to pay a little bit more and know that you are spending your money wisely and you're getting a, a good quality. But um, yeah. the, this interview is being recorded and at the moment you're in one place, but you're going to be moving. Would you like to tell us where you're moving to? I'm um, Bastyr University in San Diego is uh, where I worked from 2014 to almost 2017. 
I was the chief medical officer there. And I, we picked up and kind of moved to Arizona, back to Arizona, which we had come from. And I, um, I, to be honest, I miss teaching so much. So I, after talking with them, I'm going to be going back and teaching clinical shifts. So I'll have students and we'll see patients. And actually, I'll be also teaching nutrition classes and various, I'll uh, be running uh, well, a free clinic that the school set up in El Cajon, close to San Diego. So I'll be going back as a teacher without administrative responsibility, which really excites me. Well, we wish you every success and thank you very much for being our guest today, Tim. Thank you. This show is sponsored by Dixon's Chemist who are the experts in LDN and associated treatments in the UK. Dixon's chemists are the most cost-effective for LDN in all forms within the UK and Europe, maintaining safety standards far in excess of what is required. Why would you choose to get your LDN from anywhere else? Call 0141 404 6545 today to speak to their LDN experts. Any questions or comments you may have, please email me, linda, L-I-N-D-A, at ldnrt.org. I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for joining us today. We really appreciated your company. Until next time, stay safe and keep well.